OK, so perhaps it was wrong for Twitter to call our next sequence chart porn. But for those interested in economic data, it certainly doesn't get more salacious than this. We've brought together 11 leading economists to single out the graphic that best demonstrates a key trend in this chilly economic year. The results are annotated and explained. We'll be asking a few of the contributors afterwards what they tell us about the state we're in. Have a look at these first. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. This chart shows the yield on 10-year bonds for a number of countries in the Eurozone. As we can see, before the euro was created, the markets believed that there were substantial differences between the credit worthiness of various countries. So Greece had to pay an awful lot more for its debt. Germany didn't have to pay very much at all. Then the euro was created. The markets mistakenly thought that there was no longer any difference in the default prospects of any of these countries. They all merged into one rate, practically. Then, of course, we had Lehman's, and then we had the financial crisis, and the mood changed very significantly. There was clearly no real support mechanism for the countries in difficulty, and spreads widened very significantly. This chart shows that British private sector has been saving money or paying down debt under zero interest rate circumstances, which is highly unusual. I mean, people may be paying down debt at higher interest rates, but when its rates are zero, they should be borrowing and spending money. But that's not happening in the UK. It's not happening in the US. It's not happening in Ireland. It's not happening in, in uh, Spain. And this is not what we learn in universities. So we are in a completely different world compared to what we learn in universities about economics. Let it snow, let it snow and snow. The vertical axis on this chart shows competitiveness of one country against another in Europe, and the horizontal axis shows their relative trade performance. The countries in the top left-hand corner have had declining competitiveness and declining trade. And that is the underlying problem which the Eurozone is trying to grapple with. When we finally kiss goodnight, how I'll hate going out in the storm. This chart but is really interesting because it shows the competitiveness problem within the Eurozone. Unit labour costs in Germany have hardly risen since the Euro was formed, whereas the peripheral countries, the vulnerable ones in trouble, have all seen their costs rise by something like 30 to 40 percent. In the old days, they could get out of that by devaluing their currency. Now they can't. They're locked within the euro. And the interesting thing about this, I think, is this is not being dealt with at all by any of the summits or negotiations or deals. This is not a problem that can be solved by bailouts or write-offs. Let it snow, let it snow. I think the graph is very striking because it shows so many things in one picture. Firstly, if you look at what happened when Lehman Brothers went down in late 2008, you can see all of a sudden the Bank of England's calculation suggests that the market did think there was a chance that a country like Ireland would default on its debt in the next five years. Secondly, more recently, you see that increase has been paled in significance with the increases seen elsewhere. For example, in Greece now, the calculations suggest a 100% chance of default in the next five years. Let it snow, let it snow and snow. The reason I think this chart is interesting is because it tells me that the rate at which the UK economy can grow sustainably over the medium term, which people used to think was about 2.5% a year, is now down to only perhaps 1% a year or even lower. If indeed the economy does only grow at that rate for the next five to ten years, then unless there's inflation, UK households will default on their mortgages, that will bankrupt the banks, and in turn that's likely to bankrupt the sovereign because it stands behind the banks. That's really the issue George Osborne should worry about most. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Well, those are our charts. And joining me now, indeed, back by popular demand, the Financial Times US managing editor, Gillian Tett, Louise Cooper of BGC Partners, and Anne Pettifold from Prime Economics. And my goodness, you should have heard the gasps coming out of this uh, corner of the studio. You would have thought we were looking at Mondrian there. Um, <laughs> Anne, take us through your graph, first of all, and why you think it tells us uh, so much. We're going to look in this corner. Right. Well, my graph is taken from the government's, the Treasury's budget report in March. And it's striking to me because it shows the growth in private sector debt in Britain from 1987 till 2010. It's taken from the, global McKinsey, the McKinsey report on global debt. 
and they've excluded public debt. And public debt is a tiny is the is the bottom the dark bar. Line. It's the bottom bar. It's 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 less than fifty percent at the beginning, and it rises just above fifty towards the end. So relative to that vast amount of private sector debt, public debt is very small. But all of public policy making and politicians and economists are focused on the consequence of the growth of that private Louis, debt. What do you make of that? Because of course when the government talks, it talks about the problem with public sector borrowing and bringing down the deficit. That's what they're talking mm -hmm. about. Now if Anne's right or if Anne's chart is right, uh, the emphasis is completely wrong. Well, there's another chart um, that, that's on the, on the Newsnight website looking at the percentage of global uh, government debt as a percentage of GDP, and it shows that since the crisis has begun, it's, it's shot up very, very fast. And I would say, actually, that the creation of government debt um, over the last couple of years has been extraordinarily rapid, and forecasts for 2012, 2013 continue to see that. And, and in fact, you know, you're looking at a tripling of UK government debt in about 10 years. If you but forecast on the it gets ideological. But this in is essence, no, no, right? but that's, that's because it's a consequence of the crisis. And my point is that if you don't address the the, 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 the collapse, what is the deleveraging of that private debt now, and then you instead focus on the public debt, you are not dealing with the causal thing, the cause of the crisis. Julian, can, can the government really find solutions by sorting out private debt? That's not its role, is it? Um, well, it certainly can't act in a particularly heavy-handed way right now. But I'd like to step back for a minute and say, if you look at the totality of the charts, the basic message that they're telling you is, firstly, that many of the fundamental issues to do with the Eurozone were absolutely unworkable. I mean, mm -hmm. you look back at those charts on the, on the exports and the, and the um, competitiveness, and it's astonishing that anyone ever thought the Eurozone could work, frankly, mm -hmm. in its form. Mm -hmm. Secondly, though, they showed it isn't just the Eurozone that's a problem. I mean, the debt is absolutely key across the Western world in the UK and the US as well. And thirdly, they show that the markets are panicking about this. I mean, the level of stress in the markets right now is extraordinary. And that's a very worrying signal indeed. But I think there's one more thing that these charts show. It's the defeatism of economists. Well, there, there aren't solutions in these charts. There's only problems. There's only the end of the world. Actually. But one very, that, except for one, and that's Ken Rogoff. The mm. one very fascinating thing is if you look at the charts we've just seen today, the dashboard that they're presenting for policymakers, you know, who are flying the global economic aeroplane, if you like, it's very different from how it was a decade ago. A decade mm. ago, what people were watching were things like equity markets and inflation data, mm. and it shows in many ways that people have been simply watching the wrong metrics in the run-up to the crisis. Which, which, which is what. My chart, my chart will actually show. Let's so if have we, a look at that. If we can yeah. just get Louise's chart up here and you talk us through what yeah. we're looking so, so, at, so which is about the yeah. debt. So, so basically, what Gillian said is completely right. Everybody focuses on equity markets yeah. and bond markets. Completely ignore the sexy world of what I've looked at, FRA, OIS spread chart. I knew you'd <laughs> love that. And this is what I've looked at. And what this is basically telling you is the, the FRA is like three, the, the cost of a three-month loan for a bank and how, that, how much more expensive that is rather than sort of a, an overnight loan from the ECB sort of like done over three months. So it, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the extra cost a bank has to pay for a three-month loan in these wholesale markets that are jamming up. Now, in the summer, the extra cost was only 0.2%. It's now up to a full 1% more. And if you look... It has been forever rising. There's no kind of, oh, the politicians are going to do something, the rate comes down. Is the it's, ECB on that chart, then? It's not a real ECB. It, it's, it's not an ECB rate that it's tied to. This is more that banks go into the wholesale markets and try to borrow money. But this again and this is... shows you the extra cost of them yeah. trying to do that but, in wholesale markets. But this is, again, it... symptomatic because the banks are effectively insolvent and people are really worried about lending But is, is this telling us, Gillian, well, I mean, is this telling us, because all the political arguments about whether the ECB should be stepping in to bail out the Eurozone, is it telling us well, that more... But well, the well, ECB well, is stepping well, in. Well, but well, this is telling us that the ECB is not working. That the, that the, that the central bankers, when they try to all the things they announced to try to alleviate the problems in these markets, yeah. it ain't working, clearly. The issue is, this isn't chart porn, as you said. <laughs> what this is is chart manga. 
This is a way of communicating <laughs> fantastically complex issues and geeky bits of the market that people have ignored for far too long to the public at large. It's fantastically important for democracy. It's fantastically important that politicians actually understand this stuff and understand the other issues that you're pointing to as well, Anne. And can I say that the only reason that politicians and, and economists and commentators came to look at credit markets was because of the work of the one well, great Gillian Ted. No, but it's and, interesting, and isn't it? Because, I mean, there's been real, uh, real sort of interest in, in the data the raw data, the peeling away of all the sort of the sound bites and the politics. And do you yeah, think that's, that's because of the state of the, the summits and the eurozones and all the stuff we talked about at the I beginning? Think, I think it's terrific. We need to get the public engaged and yeah. understand how money goes around the world or how right now, unfortunately, it's not going around the markets effectively. That, and also right. be, people don't trust either economists or politicians anymore because they have been conned. They were told, don't worry, join the euro mm -hmm. and, you know, there's fairyland thereafter go out and take out a credit card, borrow to your heart's delight, and all will be well. But we were encouraged to do that by say... our politicians and by, you know, the Alan Greenspans of this world and, you know, the, the central bank governors and, you know, respected pol uh, economists. But you and, can also have the flip this... side to a chart, can't you? I mean, just the fact that you two disagreed about the way you read um, public-private borrowing yes, suggests but, that. Uh, but it's also about the way economists look at symptoms and not at causes, and there may be a reason for that. The thing about my chart was that I think it is ideological that we just have a blind spot for private sector debt, that for mm. decades we pretended, while this debt was growing in this mm. enormous volume, that it wasn't there, and we focused on the public sector. I think that's ideological and but economists the have been ideological. The critical issue is if you can map a system you can start to see what people aren't actually watching, the dark corners, and often mm. it's the dark corners that really matter. Anne deserves a lot of credit because she was trying to highlight these issues many, many years ago and unfortunately there weren't enough people who were trying to map a system, model it and then above all, all else modify it. We have to map the financial system and then work out how to change it and going so forward. And so economists have been very good at blinding us with the science of modelling and so on and, and not really talking well, common sense. We're running out of time. We'll give the last word to Louise. The reason why these wholesale credit markets are important um, is because if banks can't fund themselves, they cannot then turn around and give that money to businesses and individuals. Yeah. That is called a credit crunch. Post Lehman, the credit crunch caused massive damage to the global economy, not just the Eurozone, uh, the US economy, to the global economy. Okay. This is important. These are markets people need to focus on, not equities and bonds. Thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for coming in as well. You can see no fewer than 11 gorgeous graphs selected just for you by some of the world's leading economists on our website, the Newsnight website. Let me take you uh, 